listen, I need you to go in your Bible to John 1, verse 17. John 1, verse 17. John 1, verse 17. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Come on now, say, neighbor. neighbor. I love you. And there's not a thing you can do about it. That sounds so weird. You really don't love your neighbor, but it's OK. Watch me. The Bible says in John 1, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Watch this. I'm going to say it one more time for the law. Everybody say the law. What is the law? The law is 613 commands. They're usually referred to as the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the Torah, and it's summed up in the Ten Commandments. Y'all know what the Ten Commandments is, right? Okay, cool. Watch me. For the law was given through Moses. Say Moses. But watch me. But grace and truth, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, came through Jesus Christ. I want to entitle this very basically, very uh, uh, in a very introduction type of way. I want to entitle this sermon, What is Grace? What is grace? We're we, we going to get very, 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 very basic this morning. What is grace? What is grace? What is grace? Listen, 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 listen. How many people uh, grew up in church? How many people grew up in church? Praise God. Okay, cool. Um, as I said before, I am what people would call a church boy. I remember the first time I was called it. I was on, I was at college. And um, I was kicking it. I was kicking it with some people. And, you know, I was in somebody's apartment. We was all kicking it. And, um, you know, everybody passed around like this Hennessy bottle. Now, everybody was like just just passing the bottle around. Now, you know, now this is pre-COVID. This is years ago. Right. I know we can't imagine it because we've been in the pandemic for so long. But they were passing around a bottle and everybody was drinking. And it was I guess it was my turn to drink. So when they passed me the bottle. They was like, hey, man, you going to drink? And I was like, nah, man, I'm good. I'm good. Now, watch this. Two things. I had never drank before, right? I had never drank before. And then number two, I'm not drinking out of everybody else. That's disgusting. Y'all just pass that bottle around, and you expect me to put my lips? Oh, no. I, I, I'm not doing that. I don't get down like that. Oh, no. I, 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 me personally, I just don't do that. That's disgusting. That's unsanitary. I'm not putting my lips on that. That's, that's just nasty. And then when I didn't drink, the person next to me, he said, oh, you a church boy. And I had never heard that. Like, I had just never heard that before. It was weird. That's a common term, but I had never heard that. But then when I thought about it, I was like, I guess I am. Because honestly, honestly, when it comes to church, I was always in like the limelight. I was always like known. I served in ministry, serving youth ministry. My wife can tell you I had favor with leadership and all this and that. But honestly, growing up, when it came to Christianity, Christianity was more about an image instead of the impact by the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's, let's be honest today. Because honestly, when, 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 it, when it came to Christianity for me, Christianity was more about an image to uphold instead of a savior that needed to be beheld. If we're gonna be honest today, and we're gonna be really honest today, most of us, if you were like me, you grew up knowing about church, but you knew little about Christ. If we're really going to be honest, a lot of us learn the Ten Commandments before you learn Jesus. You learn what not to do before you learn who you were. Let's just going to we, we have to be honest today because a lot of us, we grew up knowing this is what you can't do. This is what you're not going to do. And for most of us, let's just be real today. Most of us growing up, you thought that if you were going to do anything sexual, you were going to burst into a flame. But then what happened the first time you did anything in that nature? You was like, oh, shoot. Ain't no fire. Ho, 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 ho. Ain't no lightning. Like, oh, like, we still good. So because what happens is when people don't give you revelation and they only give you regulations, they actually put you into more bondage. Because most people, they will give you the rules, but they won't give you the revelation behind the rule. Yeah. But what if I told you today that the regulations that we learn was more about a system than it was the spirit. And on today, I'm going to be very transparent because around 2016, that is when everything changed for me. Because around that time, I got really, really tired of Christianity. 
I got really, really tired of saying I was a believer, Darius. I got really, really tired because honestly, I was done because I was done with just getting up, putting on suits, going to church, shaking people's hands, laying hands on the sick and watch me judging them when I have my own problems. Because honestly, you know, if we're going to be real, church not only church not only gives you a reputation, it also gives you a mask. And a lot of times when people can't live up to standards, you learn how to hide issues instead of actually dealing with them. And I was one of those people to where I learned the image of Christianity. I learned the talk of Christianity. I learned how to walk it. Whatever the formula was, I learned it. I learned how to walk it. Hi, I'm blessed and highly favored. I knew how to talk it. I knew how to walk it. All of those things. I knew how to do all of it. But on the inside, I was done. I was depressed. I got tired of being a Christian. You mean to tell me that all there is to, to coming to church is learning what not to do and what to do this can't be it God I remember having a conversation with the Lord saying God there has to be more than this there has to be more than this there has to be more than this and and watch me around 2016 I went through the darkest period of my life and watch me that was when I really began to read the word of God for myself because listen to me Frederick Douglass said something very powerful he said when you teach a man how to read he'll never be a slave and the problem is, in most churches, we have people who don't read the Bible for themselves, but they always wait for somebody to read it for them. Right. And if you wait oh, for somebody to tell you something from the scripture and you don't read it for yourself, I can take out certain things and I can tell you what I want to tell you. How you think the North Atlanta slave trade happened? Right, right. There are slave Bibles to where they took out certain passages and they taught from the law and they taught certain principles from Paul, but they didn't teach Jesus. Because if you teach Jesus, you can't put anybody into slavery. But the problem is we have plantations and we call them churches. Because we have people who are following rubrics, rubrics, but they're not following the spirit. And, and, and the one thing when I started reading the Bible for myself, I started going down the scriptures. I started reading the book of Romans. I started reading the book of Galatians. I started reading the book of Ephesians. I started reading Colossians. And Chris, I started noticing this theme and it was all about the grace of God. And I started to see, Chris, that it was more so not about what I had to do, but what Jesus had already done. Because for most of us, we think that Christianity is do this, do this, do that. Do more, do more, do more. Christianity is not do, do, do. It's actually done, done, done. Yeah, yeah. It's a finished work. Yeah. And you had nothing to do with it, Ashera. It had everything to do with Jesus. Let me give you a very basic understanding of grace before we get into this thing. Are you ready? I need you to write this down. I'm going to give you a very simple definition. Here we go. Grace, watch me. Grace is the unearned, unmerited, and undeserved favor of God. Yeah. I'm going to say it one more time. Watch me. Grace is the unearned. Say unearned. Unearned means you can't work for it. Unearned means you can't do nothing for it. Unearned means you can't give for it. Unearned means you can't show up today. Praise God that you showed up today. But the grace of God is not on you because you're here. It's only on you because of Jesus. Watch me unmerited. Was anybody a uh, Boy Scout? Girl Scout? Boy Scout? Girl Scout? Okay, you know like when you complete a task, Nora, when you complete a task, don't you get a badge? Right. So like if you like, like help me out because I wasn't a Boy Scout. My grandma ain't let me do a lot of stuff. So, you know, I don't know nothing. So watch me. So 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 let's say you have a um, is there such thing as like a fire badge? OK, when you learn how to start a fire, you get a badge. That's how most people treat Christianity. I tied today. Got a badge. I didn't cuss today. Got a badge. I didn't listen to Jay-Z today. Got a badge. But what happens when you don't meet the requirements? Does your badge go away? Because this is the thing. If Christianity is based on you, you won't have a badge. Because if Christianity is based on you and Jesus is a standard, you can never meet it. But I'm so glad that this is grace. Grace is Jesus completed every task. He completed every project. He completed everything and he gave you his. When you get saved, you wear the badge of Jesus and not the badge of your own honor. Watch me. Not only is grace unearned, not only is grace unmerited, grace is undeserved. 
It is the undeserved favor of God. Listen to me. Grace is something that you don't deserve. You know how people say it's amazing grace because it's really amazing in the midst of who I am, in the midst of what I've done. And he still blesses me. He still provides for me. He still heals me. You don't deserve it. That's why it's amazing. But, you know, a lot of people, they 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 don't really understand the grace of God. Because they don't understand this first point, Drew, who's going to be very basic today. Number one, grace is the gospel. Let, let, let's be real. Watch me. A lot of us, if I were to ask you, have you ever heard the gospel? You would probably say yes. But honestly, in most churches, what we've done is we removed Jesus and added motivational speaking, mixed it with the gospel, and then we put people in bondage. Because this is what we say. If it's the gospel, when you do more, when you give more. When you watch me and this is what we say, Drew, this is what we say. We can't just teach grace. We got to teach grace and truth as if grace and truth are not the same thing. But watch me. I'm coming from Galatians 1, 6 to 7. I need you to hear this. The Bible says, I marvel that ye are turning away so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Watch me. Paul says he's talking to the Galatians. The Galatians are people that he founded and rooted them in the grace of God. Right. So what happens is once he roots them in the grace of God, there are people who comes in. and He says, wait a minute. Yeah, I understand Jesus. But, you know, you still got to work. Don't get me wrong, I, I, I understand that you're saved, but, you know, you still got to come to church on time. I mean, listen, listen I understand, I understand that, that God has done everything, but you still got to make sure that you serve in church. Listen to me, all of those things are good, but when they're done with the wrong heart, it is out of works and it's not by grace. Watch me, he's saying here, I marvel that ye have turned away so soon from the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Wait a minute. If there's a different gospel, what's the original gospel? The grace of Christ. Because a lot of times when we say we've heard the gospel, you might have heard the Bible, but you haven't heard the gospel. Listen to me. Just because you've heard a Bible story does not mean that you have heard the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is simply this. We've complicated, but this is simply this. Jesus came down and lived the life that you couldn't live. And then he died a death that you couldn't die. And he rose up so that you could have his life. That's the gospel. Amen. Can I give you a scripture? You all know this. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world. Watch me. It doesn't say for God so loved the church. Let me say something radical. Jesus didn't die for the church. He died for the world. Because guess what? Everybody in the church wasn't always in the church. You had to be in the world in order then to be in the church. For God so loved the that he gave his only begotten. He gave his best gift. He gave his son, Jesus Christ. For God so loved the that he gave his only begotten that whosoever believeth in. Stop. Whosoever. 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 Gay, trans, bisexual, trisexual, whatever. Whatever. Chinese, black, white. Whosoever believeth in him should not. Should not but have everlasting that's unconditional that when you believe and you receive it doesn't matter what you've been through it doesn't matter what you've done the same way God has grace on Jesus that's the same grace in your life but the problem is we have not heard the gospel so therefore when we hear the right gospel we think that is wrong therefore we think well I gotta do more there has to be something I have to do because watch me because we have been taught to do more instead of rest more let, 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 let's let's be honest. Let's let's be real. A lot of us have been taught that in order for God to move, you have to move first. Or or watch me. Watch me. People have said God helps those who help themselves. You know what scripture that is? It's not a scripture. Benjamin Franklin said that. But this is what happens when people don't read. I can tell you what I want to tell you. There are people who honestly think that cleanliness is next to godliness. It's a scripture. It's nowhere in the Bible. But we believe that. You know why? Because it's easy to tell people something when they know they're not going to read. Listen, in this church, whatever I teach you, you can come up to me and say, bro, I don't understand it. Let, let, let's, and I'll go through the scriptures with you because I have nothing to hide because I have no reason to manipulate you. Watch me. Paul says this, which is not another gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the grace of Christ. Who wants to pervert the gospel of Christ right here? Paul, he's interchanging these words. He's saying the gospel of Christ is the grace of Christ. Watch me. Let's go back to the top scripture. The Bible says for the law was given through Moses. Let's start right there. The law. Six hundred and thirteen commands. Whenever somebody tells you that you can't have tattoos 
in order to be blessed, that's the law. That's in Leviticus. When somebody tells you that you have to look a certain type of way in order to be blessed, that's the law. And people will say, well, I don't teach the Ten Commandments, Pastor Canaan. I don't do that. Well, what happens is this. If you still tell people that they have to do something first, then God will bless them second. That's still legalism. That's still legalism. You don't have to teach the law specifically, but you can still teach the same spirit. If you tell people that in order for God to bless you, you first have to do this. That's legalism. But grace says because Jesus has already done this, God has already done that. Because Jesus has already died, I'm already blessed. I'm already healed. I'm already sanctified. Watch me for the law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now watch me. When people say grace and truth are sure, they try to separate them. But grace and truth is actually the same thing. I'm going to say something radical today. If anybody that you ever hear, if they're not teaching from a new covenant perspective, if they're not teaching from a grace perspective, if they're not teaching from the grace of Jesus, they're not teaching the truth. Point blank, period. I want all the smoke. All of it on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. If you're not teaching the grace of God, you're not teaching the truth. Point blank, period. Because the reason is we claim we're teaching the truth and we wonder why people live false lives. The reason why people are so schizophrenic in church because they believe one day God loves me, another day he don't. God's pleased with me today. Nah, I don't think he likes me. One day God loves me. Uh, I don't think he does. And we wonder why Christians one day you're happy, another day you're not. Because one day they tell you that God loves you and another day they tell you you need to do more. Because what we do in church is we bait you with grace and then we bind you with the law. Oh, we'll tell you Jesus loves you. Come on in. Jesus loves you. Come on in. God loves you. Surrender at the altar. I surrender all. But then as soon as you get up here, there are 10 things you got to do in order to join the church. When you come back next Sunday, don't wear that. Y'all are so quiet in here and I can't stand it. When you come back in here, don't do your hair like that. We don't do braids in this church. Uh-uh, we don't do that. Uh, Chris, you got a toboggan on or you got to take that off because the spirit of God can't move with that toboggan on your head. Let's be honest today. Well, oh, is that a, is that a, June, is that a June team shirt? Oh, no, because, because the blood of Jesus covers everybody, not just black people. I don't care this much because honestly, because honestly, what we've done is we've added our own preferences and principles to the gospel. And we've clouded people's eyes to where people can no longer see Jesus. But can I tell you what grace and truth is? Watch me. The word truth in the Greek is aletheia. Everybody say aletheia. aletheia. There you go. You better sound like a Greek scholar. Watch me. Aletheia is not just truth. This is powerful. I need you to get this. But aletheia is actually a hidden reality revealed. Stay with me. Aletheia is not just truth. It's a hidden reality revealed. So what the scripture is actually saying is this, Fox, watch me, that grace is more than a doctrine. It's more than a perspective. It's more than just a spiritual construct. Grace is a person and his name is Jesus. But can we go deeper? Grace is not only a person. Grace is a reality. I need you to write that down. Grace. Watch me. Grace is a reality. What is that reality? Fox, watch me. What is that reality? Oh, what is that reality? Dale? Watch me. The reality of grace is this. I need you to get this. The reality of grace is this, that because of Jesus, you are able to stand in God's presence every single day as if you've never seen that one day in your life. I'm going to repeat that because of the grace of Jesus, because of the grace of God, you are able to. To stand in God's presence, let me get more radical. The presence of God is able to stand in you as if you've never done that one thing in your life. But Pastor Canaan, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. Jesus already took it on the cross with him. He already took, listen, when, the, when people say that Jesus died for your sins, they actually only mean your past sins. But the problem is when Jesus died, you weren't born. So how can he die for your past when there wasn't one? Just, just, just think about it. If Jesus died for your past and he died 2000 years ago, you didn't have a past. You didn't even have a future. So when Jesus died, he died for your past. He died for your present. He died for your future. Well, Canaan, what happens when I see it? Guess what? God doesn't see it because he already took care of it. The problem is it's not about what God sees. It's all about what you see. 
Because when you see yourself as Jesus, then the issue that plagues your life, it won't plague your life anymore. Watch me. The reality is that because of Jesus, you're able to stand in the presence of God as if you never sinned. Watch me. And it's not based on your performance. It's not based on your ability. It's not based on what you do, but it's based on everything that Jesus has done. I'm going to make this very, very clear. The grace of God is the gospel of Jesus because the gospel of Jesus is this. Jesus came down to live a life that we couldn't live and he died a death that we couldn't die and rose up so that we could live his life. Am I making sense? So not only is grace the gospel, number two, watch me, grace is greater. Everybody say grace is greater. Grace is greater. Watch me, the Bible says more over the law entered, that the offense might abound. Okay, let me give you clarity. The reason why the Ten Commandments came into existence, the reason why you had the Ten Commandments, was because under the old covenant, which means the old agreement, it means this, that God gave the law not because he loved you, but because he wanted the children of Israel, Moses and the people of his time, he wanted them to see, hey, yo, y'all can't do this without me. But I can't send my son to die yet to fix the issue on the inside. So I'm going to give you some rules to show you that you actually need a savior. But this is the problem. People today say, well, we need the Ten Commandments. But the Bible calls the Ten Commandments the ministry of condemnation because the law was never given to help you. It was meant to condemn you. Anybody got a mirror in their home? Anybody has a mirror? OK, let me ask you a question. When you stand in the mirror, Lauren, who has to fix the issues that is on your body? You do. The mirror can only expose you, but it can't change you. The mirror can only show you what's wrong with you, but it can't help you. That's what the law does. That's what the Ten Commandments does. It tells you what's wrong, but it can't help you. It can't change you. Watch me. The Ten Commandments will tell you not to covet, but it can't show you how to love. The Ten Commandments will tell you don't say this, but it won't tell you what to say. Because that's what the law does. It brings offense. And the Bible says that where the law fits, watch me, it says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, which means that when you follow the law, the law is actually increasing. The law is actually going up. The sin in your life is actually going up. Whenever you try to follow rules, it actually goes up even more. Let me ask you something. What's your name? Kelly. Kelly. Okay. Don't think about a pink elephant. You think about a pink elephant, you're going to hell. I'm telling you, you better not think about a pink elephant. I dare you to. What you think about? A pink elephant. You can't help it. So you know what that's like? You better not be hunching. You better not be having sex. You better not be going to the club. You better not be listening to that. And you know what it's doing? It's actually increasing your desire. It's actually increasing your desire for it. It's the same example with a pink elephant. When I tell you not to do it, you end up doing it. That's what Paul is saying. That's what the law does. The more you tell me what not to do, it's actually my desire that's going to increase. But watch me. He says, but where sin abounded, grace abounds much more. Can I tell you something? That whatever your struggle is, whatever you go through, however how high it is, grace is much higher. Sin can't stop grace, but grace can stop sin. Let me repeat it. I said sin can't stop grace, but grace can stop sin because the problem is if grace is Jesus and Jesus is grace, sin can't stop Jesus because Jesus already dealt with your sin 2000 years ago. But when you get a revelation of the grace of God, when you get a revelation of who Jesus is, then the issue that you deal with will stop, not because you did it, but because your mind was renewed to the graces on the inside of you. But 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 you see, the problem is, oh. The reason why people still struggle and we learn how to hide it and we learn to act like everything is OK is because of this main fact right here. Here we go. A lot of people really don't believe that Jesus took everything out of their spirit and gave them his. If you are a believer in Jesus today in the spirit, you look just like Jesus. Let me repeat it. Right now, today, if you believe in Jesus right now, your spirit looks just like Jesus. Well, Kata, how can you say that the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that when you are in Christ, you are a new, you are a new, old things have passed up, and all things become. Let me ask you something. When you got saved, were you still black? Let me ask you this. When, when, when you got saved, did your hair get longer? Okay, let me ask you this. When you got saved, did your eye, did your eye color change? 
Okay, let me ask you this. When you, when you got saved, did you, gain, did you gain more weight? Did you lose weight? Okay, okay, watch me. So that means that when God says that I'm a new creature in Christ, he can't be talking about my flesh. That means when I'm a new creature in Christ, he has to be talking about my spirit. It doesn't matter what's going on in my body. On the inside of me, I have a spirit. I live in the soul and I have a body. My spirit has been changed, even though my action has it. Well, Canaan, why hasn't my action changed? Let me give you the answer. The Bible says this in Romans 6, 14. For sin shall have dominion over you. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are no longer under the law, but you are under grace. Watch me. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are under the for you are no longer under the law. You are under grace. Let me read it backwards. Because you are under grace, sin cannot have dominion over you. Because you are under grace, sin can't have dominion over you. But watch me. But if you live under the law, sin can have dominion over you. And the reason why we're not operating in dominion is because most believers are operating in doubts. Well, well, what's the doubt, Pastor Canaan? Well, the doubt is we really don't believe that God loves us. I know you say it. I know you put it on T-shirts. I know you post it on Instagram. I know you post it on Facebook. I know you post it on Twitter. But let's just be honest today. Think about your life right now. Do you really believe God loves you in the midst of that thing that don't nobody know about? No, let, 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 let's be honest. I, I, I know, I know you listen to Kurt Franklin, you listen to Fred Hammond, Hezekiah Walker. I know that when you got a job interview, you listen to gospel music so you'll get the job. I know that when you got rent to pay, you listen to gospel music all day so you made sure that, listen, God, I need this bill paid. I'm going to listen to Kurt Franklin. I'll put that 21 up. I'll put that 42 dub up. I'll listen to that next week. I need you to pay this bill today. Because listen to me, what we do is we operate in doubt. Uh, we operate in doubt. We, we operate in doubt. And honestly, this is what it does. What it does is it creates, it creates a stepping stone mentality. This is what it, it creates a stepping stone mentality. Can I show you what I'm talking about? Watch this. I'm going to tell you what it looks like. What happens when you operate by the law? And this is what most people do. We start off here and we're good, right? You know, I gave this week. Boop. I went to church. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I'm not listening to secular music right now. Uh-oh. I cut that boyfriend off. Uh-oh. God loves me. Oh, I'm good now. And I'm good. And this is what we do. When we think we've reached a spiritual level in our life, we look back at other people and we compare ourselves to them. <laughs> I know y'all don't do this. So I'm just talking about myself. But then what happens when you don't give? Uh-oh. Dang, I didn't give today. Shoot. Okay, okay, I'm gonna give it again today. Okay, boom, I'm back. Okay, oh, good. Me and God, good. I gave again. But let's say your favorite song come on and then like you start jamming to it, right? Oh, that, dog, dog on it. Shoot. Let's say somebody call you and they say something you ain't like and then you cuss them out. Dog on it. I'm back. What if your boss say something wild to you and you have a nasty thought towards him? I'm back here. God, how could you love me? You know why? Because most people, they think that the more I do, the more I come up here and then the more I come up here and now I'm here. But watch me. If this is about you, that's not amazing. Grace, that's amazing. You and you're not that amazing. If it's all about you, if you're the reason why you're here then it can't be amazing grace because you did everything to get up here. And this is what a lot of us think, that if I don't sin, I'll be here. But when I do sin or whatever issue I struggle with, I'm all the way back here. There's no way God can love me. And what happens is we create a brownie point mentality. I came to church today, point. I'm going to talk about him a little bit tomorrow, point. You know what? I'm going to even listen to some Kurt Franklin point. You know what? I actually have good thoughts today. I'm not, uh, I'm not cussing anybody out. Point. Look at me. I'm a good Christian. And then you come to church. Oh yeah, baby. I came to church Sunday. Let's go. But then what happens? What happens? What happens when that issue that you thought was over comes back? Hmm. What happens? But come, but come, but come here. Um, Come here, Jayla. Come here. Let me tell you what grace looks like. Come here. Tell you what grace looks like. Come here. The Bible says that he has seated us in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you what grace does. 
You might not know the formula of church. You might not know what's happening in the church. You might not know anything about Jesus. But the moment you come into Jesus, this is what he does. He walks you up to where he is. He walks you up and then watch me. He makes sure the ladder stays in place. And if you fall, you don't fall from the ladder. You fall in him. See, my God, because let me tell you this. Watch me. A lot of us think that in order for God to get glory, we have to move. But let me tell you what grace looks like. Grace looks like this because God doesn't get glory when you move. He gets glory when you're still. What if the grace of God has more to do with him wanting you to rest than you supposed to be moving? A lot of us think I need to do more for God. What can you do? Just, 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 just think about it. What can you do? Listen, I got you. You ain't got to worry about nothing. You ain't going to fall. I'm representing Jesus today for you. You not. She's not going to fall. Listen to me. What happens? What happens if she cuts somebody out? She's still here. What happens if she gets angry? She's still here because she's not here because of her. She's here because of Jesus. Now, for some reason, when people hear that, they say, OK, Canaan, you saying it's OK to do what you want. I'm not saying that. I believe in Titus 2.11. Titus 2.11 says this, that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. Watch me. When you understand how good grace is, anything that's ungodly, you won't do it. But what happens when you do? Let's be honest, because ain't nobody in here perfect. Everybody in here got a struggle. I dare you to lie. Go ahead. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Come on. Let's be honest. Let's be real. Everybody in here, you got something that you deal with. Does pastor see? Uh, uh, yes. I am not worthy to be a pastor, but it's only by the grace of God that I'm here. And this grace that's keeping me and this grace that's going to see me through. But watch me. The more you try to work, the more it's more about you. The more you try to work. Watch me. Step down. Boom. Another step. Boom. Because you made it more about you than it is about Jesus. When you stand up here, it's about the grace of God. Why? Because grace is greater. That's the grace of God. Thank you, Jayla. I made some noise for Jayla. Watch me. Last point and we done. Watch me. So grace is the gospel. Grace is greater. Last point. Here we go. Grace is a gift. Everybody say a gift. Yeah. Come on, let's be honest. Say a gift. Okay, here we go. The Bible says this in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. This is a foundation of scripture in our ministry. Watch me. The Bible says this. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. And the Bible says, come on, Mac. There we go. Here we go. For by grace you have been saved. Watch me say, for by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. That word saved in the Greek does not mean just salvation from hell. Salvation is not just fire insurance. Salvation means that I'm healed. It means I'm whole. It means I'm blessed. It means I'm preserved. It means I'm secure. Watch me. For by grace, you have been saved. Watch me. Through faith. Okay, Chris, what, what car you drove, you drove today? What, what's, what kind of car is it? Boom. Okay, watch me. Let's say, let's say I had a brand new Bentley outside waiting for you. Right? It's waiting for you. I paid for it. It's yours. You're my dog. So I bought it, I bought it for you. Okay? Watch me. That door right there. All you got to do is walk through that door and that car is yours. Right. OK. All right. Right. That's what you would do. Right. OK. That's what you do. Let me ask you something. What's more ex what's more expensive, that door or that car? That car. OK. That car, because the door probably going to cost about five hundred dollars to replace. Right. Maybe. But that's probably like a it's probably like a five hundred thousand dollar car. Right. OK. OK. Grace is what I provided. <laughs> but the door is how you get to it. My God, I need you to get this. Because listen to me, you can't get grace by you trying to earn it. You can only get to grace by walking through the door. And the only way you can get through the door is by you believing. My God, that's why the Bible says, for by grace, the Bentley, you have been saved through faith. In order for Chris to get the Bentley, all he has to do is believe that the door is already open. That's what it is. In order for you to receive the grace of God, you just got to believe that the door is already open. But watch me. It is the gift of God, not of works. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. How many people in the room, you have a gift that was just memorable that you just like, yo, I remember that gift to this day. Anybody got a gift like that? That somebody blessed you with? And it's like, oh my God. Okay, Courtney, let me ask you something. 
I remember when you got engaged, okay? I want you to imagine, go back in that moment, go back in that moment where the girl who had the phone, she messed up on the phone and we couldn't see the engagement. So therefore we was in our group chat cussing her out, like what in the world is she doing, all that. I want you to go back to that moment. I want you to imagine if Dion gave you that ring and you got all those Facebook pictures, you got all those Instagram pictures, and then all of a sudden he pulls you to the side and say, listen, I got you that ring, but I put it in your name and the payment start next month. Why, 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 think, think, now watch me, think, think about it, watch me. Now you were excited in that moment. Oh my God, it's amazing. Oh my God, girl, blah, 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 you, all over Facebook. But then he pulls you to the side and says, hey, the payment start next month. I know I gave that ring to you, but it's still on you. It's funny right now, but that's what we do in church every Sunday. We give you the gift of Jesus and then pull you to the side and say, guess what? The work starts now. But grace says, I gave you the ring, I paid for the ring, and all you got to do is flaunt it. And whenever you need a reminder of what I've done, just look at the ring. Because, because watch me, if Dion takes the ring back, it's no longer a gift. When Jesus gave you his grace, he gave it to you as a gift. You see, in Greek culture, that word Greek is the word cutties. Everybody say cutties. In American English, you might read it as cares, but it's word cutties. Say cutties. In Greek culture, whenever a superior party blessed an inferior party, that was known as grace. That was known as grace. So whenever a superior party blessed an inferior party, it was known as the grace of God. Can I, can I make this more clear? Let, 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 let me work. You see, in Greek culture, there was always three components to grace. You had the patron, say the patron. Then you had the client, say the client. And then you had the broker, say the broker. OK, watch me. You see, the patron, the patron was the one who had what you needed. But then, oh, the client was the one who was in need. That's us. OK. But then you had somebody who was the broker who could provide what the client needed. But it was based on the merit of himself. And he would go to the patron and get it from him. I know that's a lot of different words. Let me make it more simple. Let me give you an example. So I remember I remember a couple years ago, for those of you who are sneakerheads, you remember this shoe. Let me, let, me, let me ask you, any sneaker heads in the building? Y'all remember this sneaker? Y'all remember this one? If, 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 you don't, if you don't remember, let, let, let me make it clear for you. This sneaker right here, this was like the highlight of what, 2017, 2017? This was the Christmas highlight. Everybody in their mama, and you know them Christmas days, everybody got them. All the little, people who don't even like sneakers, they be getting the Christmas days. Listen, I remember, I remember, watch me, looking at that shoe and thinking, a Darius bro, man, I got to have him. But Pastor C was broke, bro. You know, we ain't had nothing. I had money for rent, and I had money to get little Canaan and my wife something. I ain't, had, I ain't had no ends. I ain't had no cheese. I ain't had no money. I ain't had no ends. But I wanted this sneaker, Jasmine. I really wanted this shoe. I really, really wanted it. But then watch me, my wife... My wife saw it and was like, babe, these you, you need to get these. And I'm like, why you say that? You know I ain't got no money, so what you, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to get you something. Why, why you telling me this? And then I'm like, man, I would love to have that shoe. And then I was like, but I can't get it right now. Watch me. And then my wife, she always says this, well, you know, God will provide it. I was like, okay. And I didn't think about it. Now, you know how social media work. You know when the shoe is about to release, you seeing it about five times a day. I, over and over, I'm like, geez, I don't even follow that many sneaker sites. And the more I saw it, the more and more I wanted it. I wanted it, wanted it even more. So then watch me, the day it comes out, I'm sitting back thinking, hmm. You know you had that temptation. Like, you know what, I could catch up on this bill if I do this. But I was like, nah, I'm not going to do that. That's irresponsible. So the shoe, it just came and went, moved on. You know how, it, how, the, how the Jordan thing worked. So I go to a Christmas party the following week. And as I'm sitting at the Christmas party, there's this dude who I'm cool with. He walks in and he comes up to me real quiet. And he says, Kanan, walk outside. Come outside with me. Now, I'm thinking homeboy got a problem. I'm like, yo, do I got to call somebody yo, with me? Because he real chill about it. I don't know what's going on. He takes me to his trunk. And when he takes me to his trunk, he throws a box at my chest. He throws it at my chest and I catch it. And I, now, I'm keeping my expectations low. 
Because if I open this box and it's some, uh, it's, if it's some Skechers, then I'm going to be upset. Now, mind you, if you wear Skechers, I ain't got no problem. You know what I'm saying? I ain't judging. But I'm just talking about my expectation. I'm just talking about me. I'm keeping my expectations low now. Because I, I don't know what's going on. I might be expecting something else and I get something. Y'all you, you know, know I'm being real today. You know what I'm saying? So I open the box. And you know everybody know what that, what that 11 box looked like. I open up that box just a little bit of Darius. And I go, ah! ah, and I run down the street. I mean, I took off. I dropped the box and I ran all the way down the street. I'm shouting. I'm praising God like I'm in church. I'm going crazy. And then I run back and I had to catch my breath because, you know, I was a little out of shape. So then I come back and I say, bruh, are these the Jordan 11s? He said, yeah, man, they're yours. I said, for what? I said, why in the world? Because he likes sneakers too. Jazz, why would you give these to me? This is on your ticket. Watch me. He said he was about to purchase them. But he said the Holy Spirit told him that's Canaan's shoe. Wait a minute. Hold on. I didn't even talk to him like that. But he said that, watch me, that when he was looking at the shoe, the Holy Spirit told him that's Canaan's shoe. And when he heard that in his spirit, he immediately bought the shoe. What am I saying to you? Watch me. Nike was the patron. Watch me. But I was the client. I needed something from the patron that I couldn't get on my own because I couldn't afford it. Nike was the patron. I was the client, but it had to be a broker in between because I couldn't afford the shoe. So the broker heard my name and he purchased what I couldn't afford. That's how grace works. I can't afford God's healing, so Jesus bought it for me. I can't afford God's blessings, so Jesus bought it for me. I can't afford God's mercy, so Jesus brought it for me. And notice the shoe is red. And I'm like, oh, my God, because it was the blood of Jesus that paid for everything for me. The shoe is blood red. That's what you got to understand. That's the grace of God. Because of the blood of Jesus, I got his healing. I got his mercy. I I got his grace. I got his blessing. And it's not based on me. It's based on the broker. That's the grace of God. I barely worn this shoe. Look at the bottom. I barely worn it. You know why? Because I have a revelation of it. Because I never forgot how I got it. When you understand the grace of God and you understand this meeting, you treat it like it's something special. It don't mean I don't wear it. I don't wear it a lot because I just remember I just remember how I got it. This is what grace is. It's everything that belongs to Jesus and it now belongs to you. Let's do an acronym, grace. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's Christ's expense. Christ paid for it. It belongs to God. Now it belongs to you. Let me ask you this. How many people have ever been to a fast food restaurant and when you left the, when you left the drive-thru, there was something missing in your bag? Listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> Listen to me. Let me tell you something. That is something aggravating. When I order a full meal and my fries not in that bag, oh, we're going to have a problem. Because I pay for them fries, especially Fox, when I ask for them fresh and then I still don't get my fries. But watch me. I remember one time. Listen to me. I remember one time I went to a restaurant and I got my food. But then I got almost home, looked in the bag because you know how you like to grab a fry in the bag and you eat. It. Listen to me. My fries wasn't in there. Now, mind you, these not even my favorite fries. They not even that good. But I went back to the restaurant, not because they were that good, but because I paid for it. Am I, am I wrong? Because I spent my money, so I had to go back for it. I'm trying to tell you something, but you missed it. The reason why God keeps providing, the reason why God keeps giving you mercy, the reason why God keeps healing you, the reason why God keeps providing for you, not because you're that good, but because he paid for you, but because he spent his blood and he paid for your life. He paid for your interest. He paid for your mind. That's why he keeps coming back to you. But the problem is you keep thinking, I got to be so good. It's not about me being good. It's about me recognizing that he's good. He's that good. That's what grace is. That's what grace is. The grace of God is based on Jesus and not you. And not you. That's what grace is. And I need you to understand that this morning, that when you leave church today and you go back to life, I need you to understand 
that the grace of God is on you and it has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. That's what's amazing about it. And guess what, Sharetta? I can't lose it. It's on me and it's on me forever. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 14, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. What does that mean? That means that my spirit is perfected, but my mind is being sanctified. My mind is being renewed to the perfection that's in Jesus, that the perfection that's in me. Oh, right now you are perfect in Christ. Right now. I'm ready, Chris. You're perfect in Jesus. Perfect. Perfect. Everything you need. I need you to look at the shoe. Everything you need. Everything you need. It's already been bought. It's already been paid for. It's already been purchased. It's already yours. God's healing. God's provision. God's mercy. God's presence. It's already yours. This month, it is my job, it is my duty to get you to see how good Jesus is in the midst of wherever you are. You're looking at somebody that even though I was a church boy, I was somebody who had different addictions. I was somebody who had plenty of issues. I'm somebody I should not be a pastor. There's no way. Based on my resume, there's no way. There's no way. But the only reason I'm here is because the goodness of God leads to repentance. And that's what I want to tell you today. That grace is in the midst of your unfaithfulness, he's still faithful. In the midst of you having a moment, he's still your most high majesty. In the midst of life being crazy, he's still my anchor. He's still my anchor. I, I'm just so glad that I'm still on fire about this message. Because sometimes when we get a revelation on something, we get complacent and we get prideful and we think I already know that. I will never leave this. You mean to tell me that Jesus died for me and there's nothing I had to do to earn it? I'm never leaving this. I will preach this till I'm in the grave. I will preach this until I'm done because this is the message that saves people. This is the message. This, this message here. It's not works. It's not works. We've heard works all our lives and it didn't work. It didn't work. But this is the message that sets people free. That when you understand that you have been radically saved and you had nothing to do with it, that's the grace of God. It's a reality. 